My name is Nalani Guerrier, and I am a freshman theater major from Boston Arts Academy. <laughs> Today, I'm going to be sharing a poem with you, um, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Have you ever seen the world through the eyes of an artist? <laughs> okay, <laughs> try one more time. <laughs> Have you ever seen the world through the eyes of an artist? Some seeing their everyday blue skies and green grass while visual artists capture an image of their new masterpiece. For visual artists, it's more than an image, it's their muse. It's the Swiss-like movement that their hands form whenever they get their hands on a paintbrush. It's the fine colors that instantly find themselves onto a canvas. It's the delicate shapes that curve and arc to create their piece. It's more than just a visual presentation. It's their way of communicating with the viewer. It's the colors that express what their mind sees and what their hearts feel. It's their art. Have you ever moved like the way of an artist? Children skipping and jumping throughout the playground while their dancers work within their body to turn that jump into a grand jeté. For the dancers, it's the music in which their body responds to. It's the steps in which lead to another. It's the story that is expressed through movement. It's the energy stored within their heart, released through every jump. It's the words that they don't have to tell when they can be shown. It's the unconscious movement that they feel. It's their art. Have you ever heard through the eyes of an artist? Pedestrians along the street simply listening to music, while our musicians decipher every note and instrument that their ears can grasp. For the musicians, it's more than just the notes on a sheet of paper. It's the entire sheet itself. It's the melody that was first written within their heart, next written on paper. It's the music that leaves their heart into their instruments, allowing both you and the musician to feel something. It's their hidden inner self, expressed through music and symphony that hits their core as an artist. It's their way of being heard. It's their art. Have you ever voiced through the voice of an artist? Words simply written on a piece of paper while our vocalists combine both those words and notes to create a harmonized-like melody that is out of this world. For our vocalists, it's more than just the words that they sing. It's the meaning behind it, whether that be their pain, their strength, or their happiness. They want you to hear it all within their voice. They want you to hear what they have to say, but in their song. For vocalists, it's more than just the sound that they create from their bodies. It's the sound in which they create from their heart. It's the unconscious waves of the diaphragm that release a sound so powerful it touches you. It more than touches you. It blows you away. Because you hear them, but you hear them from here. It's their outlet. It's their art. Have you ever lived through the truth of an artist? Some sit in a movie theater and simply watch away, while actors watch closely at how a fellow performer is living the truth of a character. For an actor, it's like many other arts, it's their outlet, it's their escape. It's the truth that they are able to convey from a script. It's the switch that the actor is able to flip whenever a character is being played. It's the expression that they are able to feel alongside their audience. It's the emotion that they want to release, but get to do so in someone other than themselves. It's their truth, even under imaginary circumstances. It's their art. It's our art. Have you ever? Okay. I would like you guys to do me a favor. <laughs> I want you to turn to the person next to you, either way, and say to them, you are an artist. Okay, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Now, once more, I want you to tell yourself and say to yourself, I am an artist. I am an artist. Oh, snap, you guys did that all at once. Okay. <laughs> that is who we are, artists. The people who sit amongst you are artists. And there is a base in that word with hidden power in it. And as artists, we work to let it shine freely for all who feel there is a hidden artist within them because we walk past artists every day with such divine stories, with such divine, divine styles for their art, with such divine demeanors, personalities, ideas, perspectives, ethnicities, and so much more. And with our art, we are able to share that. And this is the art that I share with you, these words, in which both you and I are able to experience. But I want you to experience it within yourself. Whether that be through the art of a visual artist, dancer, vocalist, instrumentalist, or an actor, or even all of the above, there is no rule to being an artist. It simply all boils down to one question. 
a question in which needs a clear answer for you to find the artistic identity within yourself. It's the question in which, if we're speaking about art, we should all ask ourselves. Have I, or in the sense you, ever experienced art through yourself, through myself? Who are you as an artist? Who am I as an artist? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking Nalani again for that beautiful poem and thanking her for her artistry. What a gift to all of us today. Please join me. <laughs> Nalani is another example of the impact of the robust and comprehensive arts education program of the Boston Arts Academy. So we thank them as well. Welcome to Arts Matter Advocacy Day 2017. The energy in this room is palpable, and it is so wonderful to see so many of you coming out at this important time, so thank you for being here. My name is David House, and I'm the executive director of Arts Emerson, and on behalf of all of my colleagues at both Arts Emerson, HowlRound, and those here at Emerson College, we welcome you to the Robert J. Orchard Theater here in the Paramount. I'm honored to be your MC, or more like your guide. There's going to be a lot of talking from, from me, so I apologize in advance. More of your guide and your fearless cheerleader as we get through this morning. Over the next couple of hours, we will hear from speakers, briefers, performers, and others to help us prep and get pumped up for Arts March to the State House and to meet with our state legislators and our legislative aides and to talk to them about why arts matter. As the executive director here at Arts Emerson, we are thrilled to be able to host this event. And when Matt and his team at Mass Creative approached us to about, about sponsoring, we saw it as a great opportunity, as it fits really squarely within our mission. A mission that speaks of our organizational commitment to connecting communities through stories that reveal and deepen our relationship to each other. Many of my colleagues are here, and I want to thank them for the work that they did preparing um, for this, this day as well. Today, we will use our stories, our stories, your stories, stories from across the Commonwealth to let our legislators know that the arts, culture, and creativity are alive and well here in Massachusetts. And even more importantly, we all believe, and I know that you will agree with me, that the arts belong to everyone. The timing of this event could not be more appropriate with last week's proposal by the Trump administration to eliminate the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities. It's imperative that we take this time to make sure that our leaders know how important the arts are to the fabric of our towns, our cities, and the entire Commonwealth. These are remarkable times, aren't they? <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it. And remarkable times require remarkable action. And I can think of no better place to be this morning than with all of you as we rally together in support of what we believe and what I believe to be a fundamental right, a right for everyone, no matter your race, your color or your creed, your gender, regardless of if you're rich or poor, if you're urban or suburban, regardless of whether we are physically or mentally impaired, Massachusettsans, or whatever we call ourselves, <laughs> and every American has a right to arts, culture, and creativity without question. And today, we stand to lift our voices to say that arts matter for all of us. So I'm encouraged, I'm encouraged to be here in this room with you today, and I look forward to what comes ahead. As you can imagine, putting together an event like this was quite an undertaking. For the past three months, Mass Creative senior campaign organizer Tracy Konopinski has been the mastermind behind this day. Yes, give it up for Tracy. Where is Tracy? 
Tracy is somewhere masterminding. Um, in the, but we want to thank her for the dealings and with the logistics of the performance to producing the materials in your packets to helping with the legislative meetings. When we're doing the original planning for this day, we estimated about 250 people, and today we look like we're about over 600 folks in this space. So we thank Tracy for her leadership. And speaking of leadership, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome to the stage our fearless leader, a staunch advocate for arts in all its forms, Emerson College President Lee Pelton. Well, welcome everyone. It's really good to see you. You know, not o I'm not only president of Emerson College, but I'm proud to say that I chair the board of trustees of the Boston Arts Academy. Uh, so, which, as you can imagine, gives me great delight, uh, as you, you were able to witness uh, earlier. Um, it's a pleasure, of course, to be here with so many artists and arts patrons and loyal supporters and staunch advocates for the arts and arts education. And I want to thank David, I want to thank Matt Wilson and all the people at Mass Creative and, who, and all the others who helped to organize this, uh, this wonderful event today. Uh, and uh, I also, I think, I don't know, is, is Judy Pryor Ramirez, are you in the room? There she is, she's over here. She's the executive director of the Emerson Elma Lewis Center for Civic. <laughs> Got me? That's good, no I know, I just want to, can you hear me? because I was getting back feed there, so that's supposed to be off. Who's the executive director of the Elma Lewis Center for Civic Engagement, Learning, and Research. I want to also, Judy, thank you for your role in today's events. Uh, Emerson. <laughs> Emerson aspires to be the global hub for arts and communication in higher education, and we pursue this vision by embracing excellence, diversity, and inclusion and global and civic engagement. We are well known for our excellence in the arts. We possess the largest number of theater seats in New England, uh, that's over 4,000 seats, and our productions are the locus of the Boston theater scene. And you may have seen, at least I hope you uh, uh, read, the news in December about our unprecedented partnership with the Ambassador Theater Group, the largest international producer of live theater to jointly operate with us the Colonial Theater. At the same time, our visual and media arts uh, department is the largest in the college, and our faculty and students are making significant, significant contributions uh, in new media, in sound, in film, and both in the entertainment industry and in the visual arts. Civic engagement permeates our culture here at Emerson. Our School of Arts works with various community organizations to support artists and art projects in the city, including the uh, Asian Community Development Corporation, the Arts for Humanities, the Real Abilities Film Festival, and the Boston Poetry Festival, just to name a few. And our Elma Lewis Center inspires engagement and action by using the college's strengths and communication in the arts to support social change. We are very proud of the work happening at our engagement lab, which is an innovation hub which is focused on civic media. And last fall, for instance, the engagement lab hosted a forum on civic media and the arts in public places. And Emerson is likewise committed to public arts programming. One of the most recent examples is our newly established Urban, uh, urban Arts, it's a media art gallery located uh, just around the street here. Uh, on uh, Avery. Indeed, an Emerson education is an education rooted in creativity and expression and innovation. And members of the Emerson community share an innate desire to create and to use their chosen disciplines and media to make a difference. It means a great deal to us to host this symposium on arts advocacy. And today we come together for an important and a common cause, one that supports our common humanity. And I can't help but note that we're gathering in this beautiful theater, which is named for Arts Emerson founder Robert J. Orchard, who's been a driving force in Boston's theater scene for more than four decades. 
Together we come together, today we come together in support of the arts, in support of collaboration and creativity, in support of the great need to use our collective voices to advocate for the arts. Because the arts matter. We need our arts, as one person wrote, to teach us how to breathe. The arts bring people together. The arts connect diverse ideas and disciplines. They connect us to life's most enduring and important themes. And of course, the arts helps, to, helps us to understand our world and to be inspired by it. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson said that arts is the nation's most precious heritage. For it is in our works of art that we reveal to ourselves and to others the inner vision which guides us as a nation, and where there is no vision, the people perish. I should note that President Johnson spoke these words at the signing of the bill that created the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for Humanities, the very agencies. the very agencies, of course, that our current administration seeks to defund. This is a critical moment to make our voices to heard and to do it as effectively and as loud as possible. And today, you will have the opportunity to learn about and practice just that. And I hope you take what you learn today and apply it to the arts, of course, but that you also use it to advocate on issues about which you are passionate so that others may see the incredible value of the arts and culture across this commonwealth, across the nation, uh, and across the globe. So again, I want to thank you all for participating in today's event and, and for all that you do and will do to support, to promote, and advance the arts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. So I want to go over quickly through the agenda for the day so that we'll all know where we need to be and how we need to be there, and more importantly, what time we need to be there. As you can see on the goldenrod agenda in your packets, we will be inspired by speakers, guided by, guided by sessions on how to tell our personal stories to our legislators, briefed by experts on the issues we will be presenting at the State House. We'll see a role play of a meeting with a legislator, legislator or one of their aides, and we'll get pumped up by another performance by a group of young Boston artists. After we soaked up all that information, we'll head for our work at the State House. We'll split into regional groups, and we'll meet with fellow art supporters and partners from cities and towns who will be joining you on the legislative meetings. Here you will confirm the time and the place of your meetings and make sure you know the roles that you'll play in those meetings. At 12.30, we'll gather downstairs, we'll unfurl our banners, we'll grab some signs and march to the State House, guided by the Conservatory Lab Charter School Band and the Downtown Boston Brass Band. Yeah. We'll need to get to the State House through security and many of us need to be in meetings at 1.30. So we'll wrap up there at 2.45 at House Members Lounge in room 350 at the State House with a debrief and a talk with Representative Chris Walsh. Now, that's a full day, and I'm sure you got it all, right? We're ready. Before we move on to the next part of the agenda, Marissa Mass Creative's digital organizer would like us to let the outside world know what's happening here today. So I want everyone to take out your phones. You know the routine and take a minute to write a post, we'll, we'll give you some time, with a picture with hashtag AMAD17, and feel free to use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and if you're not on social media, then get into the picture with a friend so that they can include you as well. And, um, and now I'm going to do my own, I'm gonna take a picture of all of us together, so if you could squeeze in just a little, <laughs> bear with me, it's gotta be good, one sec.
Are you still working? Are you posting? Take 10 more seconds. Make sure your tweet and post throughout the day here at the Paramount in the March and after the le legislative meetings. You will see hand handles for speakers on the agenda and for legislators on the meeting list to include in your posts. For every one of us who are there and here, there are thousands of others who share our passion and know that arts matter to all of us here in the Commonwealth. Now I'd like to take a moment to introduce um, the Mass Creative's Executive Director, Matt Wilson. And we all know that Matt came into this role a couple of years ago and really has taken on us on a journey that we can be, all be proud of. And so I want to uh, publicly thank and acknowledge and recognize Matt for his leadership on behalf of all of us here. So Matt, please join us. Good morning. Uh, thanks, David, for that introduction and for keeping us in line this morning. And thanks to you and Lee for hosting us in this gorgeous theater. Uh, what a gorgeous place. This month marks five years since a dedica dedicated group of arts and cultural leaders and supporters formed Mass Creative. Uh, their goal was simple. <laughs> Ma? Their goal was simple. Let's build a more healthy, vibrant, and equitable Massachusetts by creating an organization to advocate for the resources and support that the arts, cultural, and creative community needs to thrive. And while the goal is simple, that certainly didn't mean it was easy. Uh, and it's a credit to all of you. And really, take a look around at all of us. Uh, we're a pretty impressive group of folks. Um, and I think for every folks, person who's here today, there's a couple who wish they could be here today. Um, as David said, when we planned this back in November, our staff sat down and said, maybe we could stretch uh, and get 300 people here. Uh, but as David says, it looks like there's between 500 and 600 people here today. Um, we should have known better. Uh, thanks to all of you, we're getting the message across that, arts, that art isn't something that's just nice, uh, it's necessary. Theater classes can keep a kid coming to school who might otherwise drop out. A suburban music festival can get folks who might otherwise never meet each other out of their homes and mingling together, forming the beginnings of relationships among neighbors that make a community stronger. And another thing artists do, we work well with others. We build partnerships with government agencies and with other organizations that support the vulnerable among us. People who need better and more affordable health care, people who are living in poverty, people who are black, Latino, and Asian, people who are Muslim, people who are LGBTQ, people who are immigrants and refugees. We work with and support those who are creating safe communities that are open and welcome to all. Mass Creative's most Im impactful work, though, is helping you share, share all of your stories, and all of these stories, and all the work to our political leaders. These stories help them understand that arts and culture is not only deserving of their public investment, but it's one of the best investments around that the public can make. In the past five years, Mass Creative's membership has grown from zero to 25,000 individuals and more, and more than 400 member organizations. During that time, with your active, passionate, and at sometimes rowdy support, uh, we've been able to increase funding for the Massachusetts Cultural Council by $5 million. double the funding for the state's cultural facility fund to help repair and maintain beautiful facilities like this. Through our nonpartisan Create the Vote campaigns around city and state elections, Mass Creative has helped inject arts and culture into key campaign debates and political platforms. In fact, you may have met there's two candidates who are running for governor next year who came here this morning to check us out. 
What a great sign that they want to be here today. And this, and this morning, uh, in a huge victory for the future of education in Massachusetts, state leaders are now meeting in Malden uh, and are scheduled to announce a new plan for our school, schools that actually prioritizes arts education as something that's jo not just nice for districts that can afford it, but something that's necessary for every district in the state. Uh, this vote, which we think is going to happen at like 11 o'clock, uh, what it will do, it will require every district in the state to publish report cards on how their schools are doing on providing access and participation for arts education in their schools. State officials have also agreed to overhaul our outdated two-decade-old arts education curriculum. So arts education is now on the priority list for our schools in Massachusetts. So we've made all this progress because of the hard work of all of us to tell our stories to the right people at the right time. And that's why we're marching this afternoon to Beacon Hill to meet with legislators and legislative aides to talk to them and tell them our stories of what's happening in our communities. Uh, we're going to share our personal stories with them, why we're called to do this work, how art and creativity shape our relationships with our friends and families, why our hearts beat a little faster when we hear students like Nalani speak uh, this morning. We're going, to show our, we're going to share our community stories with them. As you know, we're engaged in a very serious discussion in our country now about what is important and how we need to come together across cultural divides. Let me tell you, bringing, te bringing together people around arts and cultural events in our neighborhoods and town centers is a great way to start. That's where the work begins, with each of us talking with our neighbors and building from there. And you know what else we're going to share? We're going to share our values. Right after the Trump administration released, released its budget proposal with no money, zero, not one cent for the National Endowment of the Arts, a Winston Churchill meme went viral on Facebook and Twitter. During World War II, in response to, re, to a request to cut an arts, fun, arts funding, Churchill replied, quote, then what are we fighting for? I, I, I do have to say, though, that that quote is fake. <laughs> fake news. What he did say, <laughs> what he did say about the arts, though, it's a reflection of our values. Quote, the arts are essential to any complete national life. The state owes it to itself to sustain and encourage them. Ill fares the race which fails to salute the arts with reverence and delight which are their due. My, my interpretation of Churchill's words, our towns, cities, states, and country will be much richer if we invest in the NEA, the MCC, arts education, and public art, rather than fund another F-15 fighter. So it's so great to see everyone here. Uh, so let's all roll up our sleeves. Let's soak up on the tips you'll be getting next on having good legislative meetings. Have a fun and boisterous march and make a difference today up at the State House. Uh, so, so I would like to um, introduce uh, State Representative Mary Keith, uh, a lifelong artist, an arts champion, and the state representative that represents downtown Worcester, a city who is bustling with arts and culture uh, and really an exciting place to be. So, Representative Keith. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to be here. Um, my name is Mary Keith, and I represent the 15th Worcester District, as Matt said. Um, it snakes its way across downtown Worcester to Lake Quinsigamond and out to the town line of Milbury. I'm also a House member of the Joint Committee on Arts, Culture, and Tourism. Right. 
But today I'd just like to share a bit of my own life, um, my life story, and the important role that the arts have um, created in making a pathway for me. Um, I'd like to share some of that with you here today. In 1971, I came to Boston to attend Mass College of Art. And I love to tell, I love to tell people how much it costs. It was a long time ago, but it cost $300 a semester, <laughs> right? So that's kind of amazing, but um, I'm really proud of Mass Art because what it did was, um, for average working class families, make the arts really accessible and made it not so risky to try something, right? So you could have a summer job and earn your tuition with your parents throwing maybe 100 bucks in there too. So mass art is a little different today than what it was back then, but um, I'd like to give a shout out to President David Nelson because he's committed to keeping mass art affordable and accessible to working class folks, and we need that more than ever. So coming to Boston, I really um, was determined to get to know this city, and, to, and I became a real city person. Um, I majored in printmaking at Mass Art, and I remain a printmaker today in Worcester as part of the Blackstone Print Studio. And we're going to be having a show together in uh, June of this year. So I'm fortunate to be able to continue to be active as an artist. Um, the stories I want to share with you are around uh, a time in my life when I was an art educator. and. Um, I taught in public schools, and I taught also at the great institution of the Worcester Art Museum. Uh, teaching at both of these places were very different experiences, but each helped me to become a leader today, and that is what I'd like to share with you today. Um, first of all, I taught in the town of Uxbridge in an elementary school for a number of years, and I was the art on the cart teacher. Anybody here ever done that? Right? So you have to be super, super organized. You walk in, you have to get all your materials in your shopping cart um, so that you don't wa waste any precious moments in the classroom. And I say precious moments because really we only had 40 minutes, right? Um, I was determined in that role that my students were not going to be confined to paper and pencil or just dry materials and that I wanted them to be able to paint big pictures and make paper mache, too. So I had to build a lot of trust with the classroom teachers that I was not going to leave them with a big mess when the 40 minutes was up, right? And my students had to organize their workspace in a way that minimized spills and accidents. Um, And in the end, uh, they could see the value of our precious time together. So they were very earnest about um, being organized themselves. Uh, they were excited that they could use different materials and that uh, creativity was something that could happen in such a short period of time. And then we always displayed our work. Um, that particular job taught me a lot about planning ahead getting people to work with you to a common goal, and celebrating our results. At the Worcester Art Museum, my teaching experience was somewhat the opposite. It might even seem luxurious. We had the museum's collection to inspire us. We had beautiful, bright, sunny studios with lots of space. And we had two hours to work together, which meant that we even had time to evaluate our work something that's so important in this you know, society that we're in now where everything's rushed, that we could slow it down and really look at what we had done. Um, and to talk about whether we felt successful or not. I remember a painting lesson where a fourth grade girl attempting to paint the eye of the person in her painting and as she put that last bit on the paper, it exploded into a blob, 
right? And she was crushed. So we took some time and fixed it up a little, but it wasn't the same. And when we put the paintings, all of our paintings together at the end of our session um, and looked at them, she was able to share how disappointed she was. And then everybody talked about a solution. What could we learn from this? It was really an important moment for everyone. That job at the Worcester Art Museum taught me a lot about the luxury of time, that disappointment and what might seem like failure are really teachable moments, and that vulnerability is merely being human and something that we all need to share and learn from. So my teaching has truly taught me, and I carry these lessons today, how to be organized in thought and action, how to be determined in working toward a goal, how to be a public speaker, how to build trust with those that will support you and assist you in getting there, how to be vulnerable and to evaluate why things didn't go the way you expected them to do, to go, and using that knowledge to try again and also how to celebrate our successes. That's what the arts have done for me. I hope the students I have had over the years can touch some of these lessons also in their own lives. I wanna thank everyone for advocating for the arts, not just here today, but every day, as I know you do. I wanna especially thank the Worcester advocates that are here today and the city of Worcester for raising up the arts and making them so evident throughout our city. I want to thank Mass. <laughs> yes, Worcester, right? I want to thank um, Mass Creative for organizing strong voices um, for the arts in our state, and that um, we have a saying in Worcester. Um, that we use a lot because I also was a community organizer at one point as well. And um, that saying is organize people and elected officials get it done. So let's get it done today and I look forward to seeing you at the State House. Thank you, Representative Keith. It, if it's that easy, then we're gonna have a very good day. Thank you for your leadership and for your vision and for your advocacy. A couple of quick notes, um, and this is where my ignorance is gonna show because I don't know that much about social media, but I understand that we are trending number one in social. Does that mean something? Yeah. Yay, come on. So keep it going, whatever you're doing. Keep tweeting, keep um, trending and doing those things that let everyone else know that we're here and present. I'd also want to bring your attention to um, the fact that you see uh, the, the li um, live captioning. This event is also being um, live streamed by HowlRound, an organization that uh, has a national th is a national footprint, international footprint, a theater commons, and we're very proud that they sit right in our office, in the Office of the Arts, here at Emerson College. So not only are we here, our Twitter, Twitter friends and Facebook friends, but the rest of the world can tune in to see what we're doing here in Massachusetts. So thanks to our friends and colleagues at HowlRound. So now we're going to uh, take the next 75 minutes getting pre prepped for our meetings. Um, and I should ask a question, how many of you have actually been to the State House and had meetings with your legislator or aides? Yeah, so a good number, but we have, a, I'm assuming that well, those who didn't raise their hand have not, which is great, um, which means we have a lot of new faces, a lot of new friends, and we can all help each other as we, as we go out. We will take the next several minutes to um, prepare. So some of us will meet with senators or representatives, and some of us will meet with their aides. Either way, it's a chance to tell them why arts matters to us and why they should matter to them. In most offices, the aides are significant players in determining the priorities and actions of their bosses, i.e. don't feel slighted if you get an aide and not a legislator. Mass Creative has developed a basic structure for our meetings, the four C's. Can you say that, four C's? Excellent, you're great. Let's take out the blue tips on lobbying in your packet. 
and we'll run through the outline of the meeting. In the meeting, which will last 20 to 30 minutes, you will first see, you will connect with a legislator or aide, then you will provide context for talk about the impacts of the arts and culture in your area, and ask for three commitments, that's the third C, to support the arts and cultural community, and finally, catapult your new relationship to the next step. In the connection part, we'll lay out the agenda, you'll do some introductions, and those introductions will depend on the number of people in your group, so you'll have to monitor um, how deeply you go into your introductions, but um, try and keep them to five minutes. Then you'll want to take time to learn about the legislator, ask about their experiences in the art, where they go for their um, uh, cultural food and artistic food in their districts, and then fill out the responses on the yellow meeting report form, which is also in your packet. Then you'll thank the legislator or aide. If they, you know, sorry, you'll then thank the legislator or aide if they sign on to letters that co-sponsored the MPAP, MPAP bill. You can find that list of signers in on the purple piece of paper in your packet. So that was the first C. Was that the first C? Yeah, connection. For context, we'll talk about why the arts matter in the district. And I suggest that you pick one person or two to talk about their organization or about a personal experience that has had an impact on the community. And this is where we in the arts really shine. It's on our personal stories. And we're speaking the truth here. We've heard that word dropped a couple of times. It was Paul Robeson who said that artists are the keepers of truth, the gatekeepers of truth. So we want to be honest and open about the experiences that we've had and the impact that it's had on us personally and in our communities. We then ask for commitments. We'll ask, will you support increased investment in the creative community by boosting the Massachusetts Cultural Council budget to $16 million in fiscal year 18? We'll then ask, will you work with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to ensure the creation of robust and accessible school reports on arts education and the rewriting of the Commonwealth's outdated arts education curriculum frameworks? And then we'll ask, Will you co-sponsor S.1896 to establish a Massachusetts public art program? So that's the third C. And then we'll catapult the fourth to the next step. Cement your new relationship and talk about next steps. Take a picture of your, for your newsletter or social media. Hand out any organizational material that you may have brought with you that you want to leave behind. Invite the legislator and or his or her aide to an event in the district confirm any issues that need follow-up, and then thank them or their aid for their support. Got it? What's the first C? Second? Third? Wait. You're cheating. All right, but you get it. We'll remember you have the handouts if you um, need to be reminded, but also there are many people who've been doing this for years who will um, be happy to help, won't we? Yes, excellent. So now I want to introduce Sarah Stackhouse, Chair of Theater at Boston Conservatory at Berkeley and Chair of Mass Creative. She will be bringing a few of her students on stage to help us think about how to tell our personal story to our political leaders. Please welcome Sarah and her students. Hi guys. I'm in charge of C, which is connect. C is for connect. I was thinking about this yesterday and I was thinking, why is this an important step? We have, and we know this, every bit of evidence that we need and every piece of data that we need to prove that arts contribute to healthy families, individuals, communities, schools, and societies. We know it. But some people don't listen to it, or they don't know it, or they don't understand it, or it hasn't been shared with them in a way that matters to them. And what we do know is that social movements have figured out that story 
And storytelling helps you connect with other people. And when you connect with other people, they listen to you. And so what we're going to work on for C, as for connect, is um, how you can form a relationship that is genuine in a very short period of time by sharing your story and asking them their story. And I guarantee that 90% of the people you meet with will not glaze over when you surprise them with a heartfelt story about your life and the arts. And then they'll share yours, and then you have an opening to do the other Cs. We're talking about young people in a lot of our funding requests and policy requests, and so I thought rather than just tell my story, we would have them tell their stories, which are incredibly powerful, and I'm so glad they're on stage with me. My name is Sarah. And I'm from Arlington, Massachusetts. So here's the thing, you guys. When I was little, I had a really, really hard time because I was, I was, like, I was too big for the room. What this meant for me is that I had really big ideas, and I was overweight, and I talked all the time, and I was kind of bossy. It's a little hard to imagine, but it's true. And my mom, do you guys remember Lily Tomlin's Edith Ann? Does anybody remember Edith Ann? So Lily Tomlin had this character where she would sit in their giant rocking chair. So she looked like a little kid and she had a bow and she would like rock in her chair. And she used to say, my friends say I'm bothy. I am not bothy. My ideas are just better than theirs. <laughs> um, and my mom used to say, oh my gosh, that is you. So. It's funny, but it was also really hard because I couldn't connect with other people. And then, in the fourth grade, a fantastic new music teacher named Charlotte Brummett came to my school and started a fantastic chorus. Here's what happened to me in that chorus. I learned a bunch of things. I learned that I was instantly part of a group and I could be included and belong. I learned that I could channel my big, big self into that chorus and it was considered a contribution and not a problem. And I learned that I could actually lead my section and that I could lead. And so, for the, by the time I graduated from high school, you guys have feedback? Because I have feedback. By the time I graduated from high school, I was in like five choirs, and I was running the drama club, and I was directing, and I had friends. Thank God for Mrs. Brummett, right? And that chorus. And now, I'm the chair of theater at Boston Conservatory at Berkeley. I am also, yeah, right? Yeah. And here's the thing, you guys. I am also a mom who votes. Mm -hmm. And so, here's what I believe. I believe that every classroom, in every town, every year, should have arts for every kid. And, and, we all know, everyone on stage and all of you, we know that art saves lives. And we know that it makes life worth living. And so in closing, I want to testify with all of you, and Nathan, and Mika, and Allie, and Grace, and Antonio, and Zach, and Nathan, and Ryan, who's backstage, who's going to come out, and everybody else on this stage with me, that arts matter.
on. Arts matter, right? Right on. Okay. So join me in thanking these guys. They're going to exit the stage, but they'll be around later to go talk to their representatives and senators because young people are the hope of our whole future. So you can thank them in person later on. But you guys can exit and thank you for doing this. Okay, so I think if you go in to meet with your representatives and senators and you say, before, this was me, and then I encountered something, right? A teacher, an organization, a performance, an idea, whatever it was, and it changed you, which we all know the arts does, and it turned you into something else, or your family, or your daughter, or your community. If you share that story, they will not scribble. They will put their pen down and look you in the eye. And then you can ask them, you know, what kind of arts experiences do they have? What happens in their town? What are they interested in? It doesn't take long. It's really powerful. And then you hit them with the numbers and the statistics and the ask, and the ask for today. So what I want to ask you guys to do is to take out your, um, your green paper. It's a little worksheet. A couple of you have done this before. And I want to say that there, was a, there were about 40 arts leaders, and some of you have heard me say this before, so it's like a, but it's still true. Um, about 40 arts leaders did this program at the Kennedy School a couple years ago, a long, I guess, 10 years ago now. And Marshall Gans who worked with Cesar Chavez and the migrant grape workers and worked with Obama, teaches um, storytelling for change and how social movements use story. And he said, you know what, all you arts people, I'm going to teach you how to do this. And we said, we're arts people. We know how to tell our story. We're super good at it. And then we did it, and we sucked. <laughs> I mean, we really did. I think Abe Rybeck was good, and the rest of us were not good. Okay. <laughs> So, so we spent a long time learning how to tell our story well. And part of the hard thing is you have to have a couple things for a good story. You have to have a beginning. You have to have a clear twist that makes it interesting and catches their attention. And then you have to have something at the end that lifts them up. So this worksheet talks you through those steps, right? It says, be, my name is, and before I got involved with or inspired by the arts, I was. Then this happened. Now I, and now I've learned the following. That's your storytelling template right there. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take a few minutes right now, take a pen out, or if you don't have a pen, think about what your story is going to be, and then turn to the person next to you and practice. We're going to clean up the stage, practice your story, then I'll come back and tell you that we're done with that, but then you'll all be ready to go to the State House and share your story. So pull out your green sheets, do a little thinking, and I encourage you to please, if you think you're good at this, give it a try and see how it goes. Okay, thank you.
what time do we have? Okay. Hello, if you guys haven't switched, make sure you switch now because we have about two more minutes. Okay, we're gonna bring it back down. I know you all have amazing stories to tell. So even if you didn't get to finish your complete story, it's really great exercise to do and hopefully you met someone you didn't know before, which is also part of this day. This is an incredible group of people. Um, I wanted to say that depending on the size of your group, when you go in to see your legislators today, you may not all get to tell your full story <laughs> if there's a group of 10 of you. So you may have to just kind of adapt with each other, um, but it's a set of skills you can use at any scale. So just like talk with your group and figure out what you're gonna do. Um, we're gonna move from the connect part onto the context and commitment part. And um, leading off this part of the briefing is Barbara Grossman, Vice Chair of the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and Emily Foster Day, Chief Advancement Officer for the Boston Center for the Arts. Please join me in welcoming them. Hello, art advocates. <laughs> Hello, art activists. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, David. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Sarah, and your students. I'm also a teacher. I'm a professor at Tufts University, and I care deeply and passionately about the arts in this city, this commonwealth, and this great nation. We will survive Donald Trump, but it's going to take some work. And I think. And I think it is so important that we're in a center called the Paramount Center because, as Matt said, the arts aren't nice, the arts aren't a frill, the arts are necessary, they are paramount to what it means to be a civilized, thinking, creative, engaged, committed, passionate, visionary country. So thank you for being here and thank you for telling your story. As I think we just saw from Sarah and her students, Stories are data with soul. Show your legislators your soul. I've heard kids say, art saved my life. It's that basic, it's that real, and it really does make a difference. Because ultimately, you're doing what art and artists always do. You're connecting with fellow human beings. You're engaging, you're thinking together. And that's really what we all need to do at this particular fraught cultural moment. To quote Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again <laughs> because 20 years ago, I had the honor to serve on the, on the National Council on the Arts, the advisory board to the NEA. I was appointed by President Clinton and it was when Jane Alexander was the chair and when we had Jesse Helms 
the enlightened senator from North Carolina, <laughs> fulminating about artists as demons and holding up posters of art saying, this is why we need to defund the agencies and calling for the government to zero fund just what Trump is doing, the NEA, the NEH, and public broadcasting. Thank goodness, at that time, we had a president, Bill Clinton, who was very much in favor of the arts, and we had strong congressional support. This time, we have a president, the first president since the endowments were created more than 50 years ago in 1965, a president who is leading the charge to zero fund NEA, that's right, boo him, boo his, right. <laughs> leading the charge to zero fund these agencies it's quite a trifecta, the NEA, the NEH, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. These were, as we heard from Lee, these were created, the NEA and the NEH, more than 50 years ago in 1965 when President Lyndon Johnson, acting on the vision of his predecessor, John F. Kennedy, signed legislation bringing the endowments into existence because they understood that what makes us a truly great nation is to recognize and support the arts, the humanities, and cultural activity. So we now have a president who wants to eliminate them along with other minor things like refugee relief, the Environmental Protection Agency, women's reproductive rights, and so many other issues and causes that we know are part of the fabric of what makes this a great nation and we will not allow them to be dismantled. So, <laughs> thanks. I'm a Democrat, I can't help myself. <laughs> I want you to know first of all, and this is a message from Anita Walker, the executive director of the MCC, who's very sorry that she can't be here today, but she's in Tennessee helping their state arts organization deal with its process. But she wants me to assure you that our grants are from the NEA are secure through the end of this fiscal year through June 30th. That includes both direct grants to the Mass Cultural Council's budget, budget roughly 7% of our budget comes from the NEA, as well as direct NEA and NEH grants to our non profit cultural institutions, schools, and artists. But it's not surprising that arts groups and advocacy partners across the country have mobilized and are taking action. Hopefully, art supporters in Congress will understand that what Trump is proposing is wrong and makes no sense. And there was actually a really encouraging article in the Times this morning on, it's called A Lifeline for Veterans which talks about the important work that NEA-funded programs are doing with veterans who, who have discovered art as a way to help them deal with their own trauma and their own horrific experiences. So this threat to federal funding makes what happens at the state level even more important. And just as I was walking over this morning, I walked through the common as I like to do and I saw in the graveyard Gilbert Stewart's grave, and what I love about his grave, he was a great painter, it says Gilbert Stewart, artist, and it shows his palette. So 18th century, here's Gilbert Stewart identifying himself proudly, even in death, as an artist with his palette. By being here today, you are making a difference. You are speaking with passion. You are showing that arts matter. And you should know, as part of your information, that the MCC is asking for a $2 million increase in our budget for the new fiscal year beginning July 1st. Last year, we were basically level funded at $14 million. Thank goodness it wasn't a cut. And this year, we're asking for $16 million, dollars that will reach every community, dollars that will support nearly 400 nonprofit arts, humanities, and science organizations throughout the state, dollars that will support our fantastic local cultural councils, 329 of them throughout the state who do fabulous work, and I'm sure a lot of you are involved in them. So yes, let's clap for our local cultural councils. And dollars that will reach thousands of kids, thousands of kids through arts education programs 
in school and after school, there's a bottle, a water bottle that the MCC has that has a label. Did you know that 30,600 young people experience culture with MCC support? That's a big number. This is our ask, but we need your stories, your voices, your templates, your passion, your belief that what you do is of value and is so critical to our future. The uncertainty in Washington makes state support even more critical. Make your legislators, legislators, some of you whom you just heard are artists, people who do get it, people who do recognize what the arts do in a positive way for their communities. But please make them understand how you have been impacted and how the increased dollars will just enhance the quality of life throughout the state. There was an article, I'll quote one more New York Times article on Saturday, which said, arts without funding, it can be done, Kansas said. And it went on to talk about how after Kansas Governor Sam Brownback basically eliminated that state arts commission in 2011, that artists have really rallied and so they're scrubbing toilets and they're making, cooking food for arts openings. And you know, it's like, great. Maybe it can be done, but it shouldn't have to be done. I think that the, the time has passed to try to justify why the arts are important. They are. What you do is unique and of value. What you do, what we do together, makes our state more vital, more vibrant, more dynamic. What you do matters today for our future as a city, as a state, as a nation. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for standing up and speaking out. Thank you for speaking your passion. Thank you for marching to the State House. And thank you very, very much. Onward, we will do this. Thank you. Hello. I think we all understand how difficult it is each year to raise the necessary funds to do our work and do it well. As an organization whose mission it is to incubate Boston's performing and visual artists and facilitate their development, funding from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, most recently from the Cultural Investment Portfolio, has given us a reliable and important stream of general operating income for nearly 25 years, more than half the lifetime of Boston Center for the Arts. National and state funds that come through the MCC to the BCA have allowed us to keep admission to the Mills Gallery free, subsidize rent for our studios and other performance and rehearsal spaces, keeping them well below market value, and provide small and emerging theater and dance companies with a home produ for production in our plaza theaters. Without MCC cultural facilities funding, there would quite literally be no roof on the Cyclorama, a national registered landmark where right now you can go see a powerful installation by Medicine Wheel Productions, another MCC funded organization called Hand in Hand. One of our artists described his residency at Boston Center for the Arts as a critical time to just lay on the floor and think. You try to remember a moment when you could just lay on the floor and think. Maybe most of your bills were paid, imminent deadlines were met. You weren't stressed. And without that pressure on your shoulders, you could focus, you could think, you could create. The BCA can provide this space and time to our city's visual and performing artists because of the funding that we receive from the MCC. At Boston Center for the Arts, we describe our two acre group of buildings as a campus. These buildings are the professional home to more than three dozen arts organizations, large, medium, small, many of which are also members of the MCC cultural investment portfolio. For every dollar of funding that these organizations receive or lose, a ripple effect is created across the BCA campus, activating hundreds of artists in every genre and discipline who make our campus and neighborhood a vibrant cultural destination for arts audiences from all over the city. And so it goes for all of the organizations supported by the national and state grants, for all of you. Each one of us uses our funding to create opportunities for artists, for students, and for our communities. This is our work and our purpose, 
and it cannot be done without the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce, to talk about arts education, Myron Parker Brass, Executive Director for the Arts for Boston Public Schools, and Alexis, Alexis Maxwell, a student at Boston Arts Academy. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm going to be very brief because what you really want to hear is why this is important to Alexis. But it's always wonderful to be in a room full of artists, art educators, art advocates, art supporters, um, anyone who is supporting what we do. And it's not just what we do, it's who we are. But it's also wonderful that our collective message has pushed the agenda for arts and arts education in Boston and across the Commonwealth. On behalf of every arts educator, I want to thank you. And I thank you because your message not only included how arts are essential to vibrant and healthy communities or the, um, the impact that arts and culture have on the economy, but it also included that students who have access to quality arts education have higher academic achievement. Students who have access to quality arts education are more civically engaged. And students who have access to quality arts education have much better workforce and career opportunities. So arts education continues to grow. It is be becoming very systemic and very impactful both in and out of school. And that's because of your message, the message that you continue. And now finally, with No Child Left Behind in our rearview mirror, we're very excited about that. For the first time in 20 years, the Commonwealth has issued or is issuing um, a statement on the importance, the vital importance of arts education to our, to our children. As I'm sure you know, Desi has spent the last 10 months working on their accountability plan for ESSA, the plan that is going to show how the state will measure, the, measure what quality um, in education looks like in this new well-rounded definition. And because hundreds of you have sent emails, you've filled out surveys, you've gone to meetings, you've been that vocal audience, that vocal participant, we have gotten Commissioner Chester's attention. I'm not sure if he's real pleased about that, but we have his attention. And, but a result of that is that there are some things to celebrate in that getting the attention, in being that vocal voice, in being there every, all the time talking about the importance of arts education. And so in the accountability plan, DESE will be including access and participation in arts education in the school and district report cards that will be a part of this accountability plan. So this is now going to allow for transparency in what arts education looks like across all of our Commonwealth school districts. And parents and students and communities will be able to see how their school district compares to others, how, what their commitment is to quality arts education. DESE will also, for the first time since 1999, revise the arts curriculum frameworks. And this is our opportunity to redefine what quality arts education looks like. So successes, but that doesn't mean that we don't continue our push because now our advocacy and our voice is even more important. We got to this place because of overwhelming um, public support and we need to keep that momentum going. We need to ensure that our legislators hold DESE to their commitment over the next two years. And so as you're out today, that's part of what we hope you will be talking to them about. We need to keep our parents um, moving forward. 88% of the parents who were surveyed across the Commonwealth said that arts education is important. And we, as the arts and arts education community, need to continue to push to change the narrative 
on how we talk about arts edu ed education. There should no longer ever be a question about the importance of quality arts education in the life of our students, our schools, and our community. And now you're gonna hear why it should never be a question. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, um, <laughs> my name is Alexis Maxwell. Um, I'm a sophomore at Boston Arts Academy. Oh, um, if you've seen our production of The Wiz at the Strand Theater, uh, you may know me as Ada Pearl. <laughs> stop it, stop it. Um, okay, so anyways, today is all about advocating for pieces like The Wiz. Today is about advocating the power, like celebrating the power we have to express ourselves through the arts. And I'm here today to talk about how my school, Boston Arts Academy, or BAA, has helped me on the journey to finding my power to express. Before BAA, I went to a Catholic school. Um, it was great, it was really nice, um, but they weren't really about individuality, you know, with the whole uniform thing going on. Um, so, it, and it was really sad because I had all these like opinions and thoughts in my head and I couldn't share any of them. And, but like at BAA, it's not the case. <laughs> From the moment I walked through the doors for my audition, my audition, this, so this was the first time I stepped into the school. I saw people expressing themselves through their opinions and through their clothing and through their art and just, you know, just moving as if everything they do is about creativity. And that is what showed me that it's okay to speak out because at BAA, your, your voice is heard. And art gives us the power to speak out, but also it gives us the power to listen to each other. And that's why I believe a school like BAA is so important because when I'm allowed and encouraged to express myself through art, that motivates me to want to go to school. Um, <laughs> I mean, education is good too, but like arts. <laughs> yeah. When my teacher, um, gives us artistic leadership and allows us to create our own pieces. She's telling us that our ideas are valid and that our creativity matters. And when there are a bunch of artists together, all people who deeply love what they are doing so much that it nearly, nearly, like every day, and that the love empowers like a flu, it's so contagious. Like the love of art is just so amazing. Um, it's like I'm drawn to the school because being around those people encourage that encourage and support my expression, whether it's through a song or through dance, a drawing or a monologue. Um, it makes me want to get up at six in the morning and go to school. <laughs> and that's also why my love for theater made me want to come out and speak today. Because I think it's important that all children get to experience an arts education because all children should want to go to school and all children should feel that their voices matter. Thank you. <laughs> And if you didn't see The Wiz, you missed an amazing performance. Where did she go? <laughs> so now I get to introduce um, Mass Creative's Andre Green and Deborah Greel, public art, art placemaker at the, for the city of Salem, to come up and talk about creative placemaking and public art. What an act to follow. <laughs> so every year, every year, Camo spends $200 million on new building projects. In every city and town in Massachusetts, state government infrastructure provides the backbone, shaping how our communities look and feel. How we spend that money, how we prioritize our infrastructure, can be immensely powerful in bringing us together or as some might have it, tearing us apart. From small investments and in benches to large products, like the artwork many of you saw on the tea and you're coming in this morning, investments in public art provide an opportunity to leverage public works to build healthy, vibrant, and equitable communities. Which is why Mass Creative worked with representatives Corey Atkins of Concord Chris Walsh, and Chris Walsh of Framingham 
alongside Senate President Stanley Rosenberg of Amherst and Senator Eric Lesser of Longmeadow, Longmeadow excuse me, to convene a task force representing planning groups, community development organizations, working artists, and others to review how other states have funded public art on public property. What we discovered is that 28 states, including every other New England state, and including such progressive bastions as Utah and Louisiana, <laughs> has some form of mechanism to fund public art. We chose to model our program on the oldest and we think best state public art program, the one in Hawaii. By directing 1% of new capital spending, we can create a fund of $2 million every year to be spent on public art projects on state land. 38 members of the House co-sponsored their version of the bill, which is called H2717. Now we're asking members of the House and Senate, and we're asking you to ask them, to co-sponsor the Senate version, S1896. In doing so, they can join their colleagues in being champions for public art in our communities. As Deborah Greel is about to, is about to attest, the kind of projects $2 million every year could fund in public art can literally, and I do mean literally, I don't mean figuratively literally, I mean literally, literally, <laughs> literally transform communities. Deborah? Hi. This is pretty exciting. So I, told, I was told I have 330 characters, so about two tweets. So I'm not going to make this long because I'm sure everybody's getting restless. So I just want to tell you, I'm lucky to be a public art planner. There aren't a lot of us in Massachusetts right now. Um, the city of Salem made a commitment uh, to fund my position in the planning department. So I get to sit at a lot of meetings where developers are. So I'm just going to toss that out in terms of thinking about your own cities and where your art sits. We need to be better at being at the beginning of the conversation of art and not at the end when they want to stick something on a building. So. <laughs> So anyway, so um, my budget's $10,000 a year, which doesn't go very far. So what we did this year is we took some of that money and we divided it up into small grants. And so we don't have pictures, obviously, of where we'd like to. So we're, we're calling it Celebrating the Urban Environment. So we're inviting artists um, to put a proposal in that's actually due this Thursday. And so one of the places that we're trying to put temporary art, anybody here from the MBTA? Because I didn't get permission. But anyway. <laughs> The mayor said it was okay. What they did was we had a train station entry, and um, when they built a new one, they just left this sort of blighted wall that's very present in our downtown. So we're asking somebody to put some temporary art on this, and so just to sort of you know, be a little radical about it, you know, just not asking permission quite yet. Um, so we're going to see how that goes, and I can sort of send some pictures out once we see what some of the artists are coming up with. Um, the other thing, and I'm very excited to say that um, we actually, I got on some lists, so we are getting attention from all over the country. We're getting proposals from all over the country for a $2,500 project, so as one of them. So, you know, even if you have a tiny budget, get it out there. Let people know what's going on in your towns. So, but if I had some of that $2 million that Andre said, Let's go back to a different train station on the other end of town. They spent, I don't know how many millions of dollars building a beautiful train station, which is on one of our gateways. And I don't know if you know Salem, but we get a lot of tourists every year, people coming and going. But the entrance is blighted. It's, there's an overpass. And so you're coming into this really nice train station, but you're having to come into a place where it's not painted, it's concrete. It doesn't say, hey, you've arrived in a creative city. So if I had a little bit of that $2 million, I would go to the MBTA, I would go to the state, and I'd say, we have a project. We have a beautiful project. Let's paint it. Let's light it. Let's get some art there. Let's get some life there. Let's do a lot of that. So that's what we're going to do with our money, and let's get out there, and let's ask for it, because it's time, Massachusetts. It's time for us to fund our public art. So. I look forward to seeing you at the State House. Thank you.
All right, we're getting there. We are getting there. Are we pumped up? I feel like we need a dance break or something, but um, that wasn't in the script, so dance in your head, move your fingers, do what you need to do to, to get through. Um, a couple of things, just to thank um, our little our panelists who were up here to help us connect and, and give us context and the commitment and the catapult to Barbara and, um, oh Lord, I knew I was gonna do this, uh, to Sarah and her students, to Barbara and Emily, to uh, Deborah and Andre, Myron and Alexis. Thank them for their presentations this afternoon. I also have a quick update for those of you who are texting, Facebooking, and Instagramming. Um, we are still trending number one here in Boston. Now we're number six in the nation. So, yes. So keep it going. More pictures, more, more tweets. This, this all feels right to me. And also, one other acknowledgement um, that we love having the students um, who are present with us. And I just want to give a shout out to a group of students who traveled far, far away from North Adams on a bus this morning, 50 students from the Massachusetts Col College for Liberal Arts. Where are you? We see you. They're in the balcony. That's a long way to travel, so we know that you care and are passionate about the arts, so thank you for the work that you're doing um, in North Adams and, and beyond. Um, okay, so now we're gonna package up all this with a role play with Representative Christine Barber from Somerville and two of her constituents, Heather uh, Balkunis. Oh, Lord, I didn't get that. No, Heather, yes, pardon me. And uh, Jason Behrens. And following the role play, then we will um, have our performance by the Conservatory Lab Charter, and I'll come back for that. So, welcome. I'm State Representative Christine Barber. I represent parts of Somerville and Medford. Thank you. I'm a strong supporter of the arts, um, and one of the reasons that, that I am um, on the right page on budget funding for Mass Cultural Council, as well as the Percent for Arts program and education, arts education in schools, is because I have amazing constituents who prioritize the arts and come to me all the time to talk about arts. Um, and it's the constituents that actually keep me up to date on what's going on. So we're gonna do a, a quick role play on meeting your legislator. Um, before we do that, I wanted to just say two things. One is that um, while all of your legislators may not be as familiar with the arts, they know that it's critical to their communities and you can help to make that case. There are so many issues coming at us during budget season, which this is. Um, it's really critical that you're showing up in your legislator's office to say, this is a critical part of our community and this is why it matters to me. I can't say enough about how much, how important it is for you to go and make that case during this busy time when we're hearing a lot from a lot of people. So that's one. The second is you may very likely talk with our staff um, and I don't want you to be disappointed in that. I actually think sometimes it's better to talk to the staff. Um, our staff really run the State House, um, which I will admit, they keep us on task, they keep us informed, and um, they're extremely well versed on a number of issues. So if you're talking to a staff person in an office, it is um, just as good as talking with the senator or as a representative. So thank you for coming today, for all the work that you're doing. And with that, I think my constituents, um, Heather and Jason, we're gonna do a quick, quick role play. Welcome, thanks for coming in today. Uh, thanks for coming, thanks for meeting with us. It's really nice to be here. Yes, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, meet with us. I'll move this over here. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's better. That's better. Yeah. So I only have a few minutes, but I would love to hear about the project that you're, you're here to talk about. Well, well, first off, I really want to thank you for uh, your support in, in uh, the FY17 budget to veto override and also supporting the impact uh, and co-sponsoring that bill. 
Thanks. I was happy to do it. Um, arts are a critical part of the economy and bringing people together in, in Somerville and in Medford. Uh, arts have played a really critical role in Somerville. Um, my colleague here works with the Arts Council, and we've worked together on a couple of projects uh, as a preschool teacher and an after-school educator. Lots of messy art projects there. Um, <laughs> we saw the importance that uh, art plays in the roles and the lives of children as a, a creative outlet, a way um, for kids to really uh, express who they are uh, in their community. I mean, as you know, as a representative in Somerville and, um, and as an arts administrator with the Somerville Arts Council and as an artist myself, I, I can't tell you how much the arts are important to me personally and ever since I was student at MassArt, and I'm, I know that uh, it's important to you as well, but I'd love to hear more about some of the active roles you have in our community. Mm -hmm. So in my district, um, especially uh, some of the arts programming, like Art Beat in Somerville, like Cache in Medford, which is also part of my district, um, art, the arts and the art community has really been bringing people together and building connections across cultures, across communities in a way that I don't think would happen without the arts. Um, and it also is really helpful to our economy. Uh, we are, Somerville in particular, is a community um, that has really, um, we've been trying to support our, our, our arts community um, and looking at broader issues like affordable housing and making sure that artists can stay in our community. And we know we have a lot more to do, but um, it's something that I'm a strong supporter of. Well, with that said, are you willing to support the increased investment uh, in the creative community by boosting the Mass Cultural Council's budget by $2 million this year? Um, yeah, what would that bring it to? to I, think it's, I think it'd bring it from 14 to 16 to million. 16 million? Yeah. I think that sounds very reasonable, so I'm happy to support that. Fantastic. <laughs> And to expand on, um, on that, would you also be willing to help uh, redefine and restructure the outdated laws from Massachusetts Commonwealth uh, that uh, help support a more vibrant arts education framework uh, and, and to support uh, um, ESSE and, and, uh, and, and, that, and that continued support for arts education? Yes. I think um, including the arts in education is a critical piece. And um, for me, who is someone who I will not say had a particular talent in the arts, but I, I loved arts education and it was so critical to my development and I think to problem solving and how I um, think about issues differently, that even though I do not have an arts career that, um, as a student, I really appreciated having the arts um, as part of my education. And I don't think it would have been a full education without it. So I'm happy to support that. Thank you so much. Well, so I'd like to extend an invite um, to a couple of events. Great. Uh, Somerville is going to be hosting a, a STEAM week, science, tech, engineering, arts, and math, um, at the end of May. And we'd love for you to come by and join us and take part. That would be great. I would love that. And we also have a very big event coming up in the next few weeks. Somerville Open Studios is going to be happening. And uh, it's, it's, it's one of the largest open studios in Somerville and where over 400 artists will be participating in many different genres and it's a great way to, to experience art, at free, local, and also um, there's trolley, so it's very accessible for, for, for many people. So. That's great. I never miss open studios, but it's a good reminder for me to get the word out to my constituents about how easy it is to see art in your community. Well, uh, lastly, I'll say, um, speaking of art in the community, um, there's this incredible park on the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Uh, it's the Armenian Heritage Park, yeah. uh, and there's this incredible rhomboid dodecahedron mm -hmm. sculpture that changes every year mm -hmm. because it's telling the story, not just of the Armenians, but of all immigrant communities. Um, and so this Sunday, they're actually reconfiguring the sculpture. So it could be a special treat if you're looking for something to do this Sunday from eight to noon. <laughs>
that, come check out the park. That's, that's a great a, idea, a really and I'll, I'll get for more information about it. Perhaps okay. we can get a cup of coffee and meet we there could, and, that talk, sounds great. and talk that more sounds about great. this. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any last things you want to leave me with? Well, first thing, uh, you know, again, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. I, I, I know you have a busy schedule, but this really means so much to not only us, but the rest of the Arts Committee in Somerville, and I know uh, the rest of the Arts Community throughout the state. So we really uh, thank you for your support, and uh, and have a good rest of your day. Thank so. you. <laughs> well, thank, thanks to you for taking time out of your day, out of work, to come in and do this. I know um, it can be hard to come up to the state house to make these visits mm -hmm. but reminding me and hearing about what's going on in the community is really important so thank you for coming in today thank you now you can see that um acting was not in my repertoire as a student but thank you all again really thank you for coming today and for all the work that you're doing and uh good luck Thank you, that was uh, pretty easy. So I think we're getting ready and getting closer. Um, but uh, now we'd like to welcome to the stage the Conservatory Lab Charter School's Winds and Brass Ensemble to perform a little bit and get us psyched up even more so than we already are um, for what's coming very shortly, which is our march to the State House. So at this time, we'd welcome the ensemble to the stage. Thank you so much. Oh, we're not done. Y'all sit down. We're not done. We, we, didn't, we didn't take the tea for an hour just to get here to play one piece. You kidding me? For real, man. So we, we're a conservatory lab charter school. This is our elementary school. Elementary school, fourth and fifth grade. Fourth and fifth grade, wind and brass and percussion. Give it up for Adrian. Percussion ensemble, all right?
it's a lottery-based school, and there are no auditions a part of the, the process here. And what we do at Conservatory Lab is we have an hour and a half of music every single day. And that's, and that's part of our curriculum. It's part of what we do. It's part of what we talk about. It's how we live and, and breathe in the, in the academic side of things and the music side. And we use music not only as a vehicle to, to be better at music, but we also use it as a, as, a, as a point of advocacy, as an opportunity to get out to the community like we're doing right now and talking to you and talking to the, the folks at the State House and, and all other, other parts of the, of the world. And so I thought, well, what better way to, to, to do this performance in, is to give you an opportunity to be a part of our group today. And so there is a piece called We Got That Fire. All right, All right. it's not grammatically correct, but that's, we'll just, you know, we have that fire was taken, I guess, I don't know. Okay, so we got that fire. We're gonna play it for you once, and then I'll teach you a little bit of the vocal parts. You bought your trumpets though, right? Everyone brought trumpet? I thought that was part of the prerequisite. You had to come and bring a trumpet. Okay, here we go, this is We Got That Fire. Ready to go? Repeat after me. I said, whoa, sing. Whoa, you guys are, whoa. One more time, and whoa, one more time, whoa. We got that fire, we got that fire, sing it now, and again, we got that fire, we got that fire. Wow, amazing.
Bravo. You know, it's not easy to sing a cool song like that and clap on two and four. So <laughs> y'all should walk out of here feeling incredible. Okay. So we are going to join our, our very special friends, Babam, which is the Boston Area Brigade of Activist Musicians. Uh, yeah. Woo. And, uh, and Babam, they're wonderful people. And, and we've had an opportunity to play uh, in, in various parades and, and different fun functions before. And so this, I think, is the most important gig that we'll have all year, which is going to the State House. So at least you'll know one song that we're going to play on that piece. And when you hear it, I hope you sing it as beautifully and loud as you just did this moment here. Wow, you're all the way up there. I didn't, hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. We are Conservatory Lab Charter School in Dorchester. Thank you. Wow, we've got that fire. I love the energy. I love seeing you sing. I was just waiting for you to dance, but that's, that's the next piece. OK, here we are. So now, yes? Oh, sorry. We now want you to meet up with other folks. Please don't move. Here from your district so you can prep your meetings with your legislators. We're going to do this in a couple of steps, so hold tight as I walk through them. We'll be in these groups for 15 minutes. At 12.20, it's now 5 till 12, we'll start wrapping up so we're ready at 12.30 to head out for the Arts Matters March through the Common to the State House. So follow your captain's lead on that. All right, everyone take a minute to take a look at your name badge. There's a number on the front that tells you what Senate group you're in. And on the back, your meetings are listed based on the information you gave in your RSVP. If you don't have a number, you can refer to the meeting sheet that your captain has to find out where you're going. Now, I want you to know where your captains are in the theater so that when we start to move into those groups, you know where to find them. Let's make this fun so when I call out your name, I want you to stay seated and cheer. All right. We have captains one and two in orchestra left. Oh, your captain is down here. One and two, orchestra left. We have captains three through 15 in orchestra center. Cheer, that's your cheer. Yes, we have captains 16 through 19, orchestra right. No, everyone's supposed to cheer for them. Yay, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Up in the balcony left, we have 20 through 27, cheer. And balcony right, we have 28 to 35. Now, I'm going to start inviting you to move into those groups, but it's not all going to be numerical, so pay attention. We want to keep you on your toes. And before we move, um, I just want to say that uh, it's been so inspirational to be here with you today. And from all our many walks, I'm reminded of a Negro spiritual that says, walk together, children, don't you get weary. And I'm going to adapt it to say, sing together, and dance together, and paint together, and write together, and create together. Don't you get weary, because there's a great camp meeting. So pleased to be here today. So. I'm going to first start by calling the groups that will be meeting in the lobbies and on the stage to help free up space in the theater for other folks to move around. Are you following this? Yeah. Okay, good, because I am not. In the Randall lobby, where we had breakfast, that's right back here at the back of the orchestra, we have groups 2, 14, and 19. Everyone in groups 2, 14, and 19, stand up. I see you. Stand up. Okay, everyone in those groups, head now to the Randall Lobby, and we'll applaud you as you leave. <laughs> Don't dawdle. Keep it moving. In the downstairs lobby, we have groups 8, 9, and 15. 
Everyone in groups 8 through 9 and 15 now, you can stand up. And you can believe moving, begin moving, and we will applaud for you as you leave. On the stage, we have groups 3, 10, and 16. Can you stand? And carefully make your way to the stage. 3, 10, and 16. 3, 10, and 16. 2, 14, and 19 are in the Randall lobby, which you can exit just up this way. 8, 9, and 15 are in the downstairs lobby, which you can exit this way. And 3, 10, and 16 are here on the stage. Excellent movement. Move with purpose. And for the remaining groups, everyone will be meeting in the theater where your captains are currently standing. You can refer to the group chart on the screen.